Hey, welcome to the G Free and Happy Show that happens every Monday night at 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Eastern. I'm your host, Kathy, and I have been G Free and Happy for five years. Actually, this month it marks my anniversary. So I am thrilled, thrilled beyond belief because I've I've been dealing with this hormonal menopause stuff for a while. And I wanted to get somebody on my show. And it just happened that Jennifer with Gluten Free School, which we all know and love, uh, introduced me to um, Kelly. And so now I have her on my show and we're gonna talk all about, and men that are watching, don't be afraid to stick around because I'm sure you know somebody going through this and you'll know more about this subject. Um, but first, before we talk to Kelly, uh, we're, uh, episode what number are we 61 of the g free and happy show is brought to you by oval eye tv oval eye tv believes in building community through shared experiences we produce professional live webcasts that bring tribes together visit oval tv today so we're going to bring on kelly because i want to talk about this subject we're talking about hormones menopause and the gluten-free lifestyle so let's bring on kelly Hi, Kelly. Hi. Thank, hi. Thank you, you so much uh, for being a part of this because you are on the East Coast. It's late. You have a busy schedule, I'm sure. So thank you again. Um, <laughs> oh, I have, I'm always appreciative of anybody on the East Coast that does my show on a Monday night. So thank you. Uh, so Let's why don't see. you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, so I am a holistic psychiatrist in Manhattan, uh, Midtown. I'm focused primarily on, on women's health. So my initial specialization was in pregnancy and postpartum, and now it's expanded to really include, for the most part, the entire reproductive cycle from menses to menopause. Uh, and I endeavor to help people with all manner of quote unquote psychiatric issues that range from fatigue, insomnia, sort of general malaise to more severe pathology like bipolar and schizophrenia and I, I do that without medication. The best part is you do it without medication because I am, I, when I turn 50, there's no medication in my, my house. Um, I don't want to take it anymore. I think uh, all I want to do is heal my body. So that's another reason why I have you on because you're very, and I love this, you're holistic and you're practicing without these things. Um, because the first time I went into a modern doctor, you know, my regular doctor before I went to the, the holistic part too, is uh, they'd give me a pill. They'd say, oh, you have that symptom? Well, that means you're in menopause and you need to take this pill. And then when that pill doesn't work, oh, don't worry, there's like 10 billion pills you can try. So then like three months later, five, whatever, it doesn't work. Okay, here, try this, the pharmacy knows, you know. So it's a constant, um, yeah. you know, trial of these pills. And that's yeah. another reason why I wanted you on. So uh, tell us. Different. Yeah. First off, uh, okay, the first thing I want to know is when is menopause? What's this premenopausal stuff? And tell us a little bit about a timeline of hormonal fun. So uh, we sort of think about it in three primary parts. So the first is actually has a lot of overlap with the symptoms of PMS, even severe PMS, and it's really characterized primarily by uh, lower progesterone. As you begin to ovulate less regularly, uh, you produce less progesterone, and then that perpetuates this irregular ovulatory pattern with somewhat irregular cycles. You may start to have changes in the length of your cycle. You may drop a period. Uh, and then what happens is there's um, stimulation of what is left in the ovarian follicles uh, by the brain, actually by FSH, a hormone. And then you enter this um, sort of what we call a hyperestrogen state. So it's also sometimes called estrogen dominance. And that's when women can deal with a lot of mood-related symptoms. That's you know often when they land themselves in my office. Um, <laughs> And it's really, you know, after that 
year of, of no menses um, that you know you sort of cross the menopausal threshold and estrogen begins to dip and that's when you can start to have hot flashes and uh, your genital symptoms like dryness um, and and that's you know often can persist um, you know sometimes for months and sometimes for years and there's not really a predictable course in terms of how long this can take the onset of menopause we observe is actually, um, you know, it's actually creeping up in years, you know, for women, and and some of the theories around that relate to the role of what are called xenoestrogens, um, so environmental compounds, whether it's pesticides or plastics, um, so these the industrial chemicals that actually compound that estrogenic state that I mentioned, so that estrogen dominant state, and. So, you know, it's, it's the same theory about why girls are getting their periods at eight, you know, and, and women are entering menopause uh, and, and sometimes ovarian failure earlier in, the, earlier in their life. So that's sort of like a, you know, an overview of it. That's a very good point that uh, it, it does seem to be happening sooner than later. I thought it would be later in my life and it's now. <laughs> it's fun. Um, I like the part where you said... Uh, well, this whole thing, you're kind of a psychiatrist for people like us because our moods are so fun and exciting. And so tell me a little bit about what you do for people because you get to that point and you go and see somebody and, and it'll probably take a few stages to get to you. So they must be really excited to see you um, at that point. So tell me what, what kind of thing do you do when, you, when somebody like me goes into your office? What would you um, kind of suggest? Yes, absolutely. So, so my primary goal is to help women identify uh, the fact that how they're feeling is not just in their head, right? So um, usually they're coming to me because somebody has suggested to them that they're dealing with, you know, mental issues or, you know, psychiatric issues or maybe their OBGYN or their internist feels like, you know, they could use an antidepressant, sort of even them out. And I look really first, you know, at this web, right? So, so it's not just about the hormones either. It's not just about the sex hormones like progesterone and estrogen. It's also about how they're related to other important hormones like thyroid and cortisol, for example, uh, primary stress hormone. But then how those hormones are related to other drivers like um, causes of inflammation. And I focus a lot on the gut as you mentioned, so on, on healing the gut and what does that mean. So when I mean a patient, um, I do some you know basic diagnostics. I'm very interested in thyroid. I recovered myself uh, from a autoimmune thyroid condition, and so I you know whenever you deal with something yourself, you develop you know some degree of expertise in it. So I, I'm interested in thyroid, and I test very extensively for, for the presence of that in, in blood work, and I have patients take their temperatures and things like this. Uh, and then I also look at the best way we know to assess what's going on with their adrenal glands, which are essentially um, determinants of how their body is managing its stress load uh, in terms of their hormonal outputs. But this, um, the role of cortisol is very important also for management of inflammation and the immune system. So I'm very interested in that. Um, and then I, and I ask them questions about their gut function. Do they poop every day? Do they have gas? Do they have This is a gut? fun show. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big topic in my office. Um, you know, because even if everything is picture perfect, um, it's funny, you know, when I ask women, do you have a bowel movement every day? The answer is pretty much yes or no, right? Should be yes or no. Yes. But I never get a yes or no answer. I always get, um, yeah, pretty much. Or like, yeah, I guess so. So, it, you know, it's just emblematic of how out of our GI systems and, and how, you know, really um, abnormally functioning sometimes they are. So I focus a lot on that. And, and my people don't know that. Yeah, they'll say what you just said. And so it takes somebody like you to get those questions in their brain, because I had all these questions asked to me recently, too. It's like, huh? Exactly. Why do you need like, to know all this? With anything, yeah. right? 
because it seems unrelated, but it's, you know, it's, it's really where medicine is going, as far as we can tell, is focusing on that, you know, the, the, the microbes that live in our gut, our immune system there, and how inflammation from that source can influence our hormones, can influence our brain functioning, um, can can generate conditions like autoimmune conditions, and it's 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 how we know that diet is the best point of entry. Um, and so let's talk about that um, this the diet that you would prescribe to somebody. And by the way, so um, the menopause, the premenopausal stuff. I mean, I started getting like hot flashes and stuff back in my 30s. Uh, mm -hmm. does, so it just kind of depends on the environment and uh, where you started your period and things like that, right? To get to... Yes, yes. And it's also a matter, you know, it, listen, in many ways, menopause is not a pathology, right? So there's there's many aspects of it that are actually... Um, you know, that are a natural process. Uh, but there are also ways to help support your body through it and to minimize some of the more extreme manifestations of discomfort and moodiness. And, you know, the best way to do that, to answer your question about diet, in my opinion, is to focus on a diet that at once balances blood sugar and I'll describe why I think that's important, um, and also supports fat in your system. That's which wonderful. Are, yes, explain. Yeah, which is directly related to the balancing of blood sugar. So, so I'm interested, you know, in, in hormones and brain health for the most part. You know, that's, that's what my practice is based on. And so I, I look to, you know, the, the ancestral history that we have of consuming a high natural fat and actually particularly the much maligned saturated fat uh, diet for the better part of you know several million years right and it's only since the 50s that we've been taught that all of these very nutrient dense foods whether it's you know egg yolks or organ meats um, all of you know these traditional sources of fat are actually bad for us and dangerous right so we've been taught that low carb or the rather low fat high carb diets are actually what are going to keep us well and in fact we're sicker than we've ever been you know in the history of humanity probably so the so when i think about you know what is the best way to provide a woman's system um, optimal energy balance and optimal energy uh, metabolism, it's going to be through restricting sources of uh, refined carbohydrates, but even whole grains. Um, so res restricting grain-based carbs. So I, I take gluten-free even one step further um, to, to really restricting grains on the whole. And uh, I also request that patients try, at least for a month, uh, eliminating dairy. And the reason for that, at least in my practice, is because both dairy and gluten have proteins in them. Um, so, so gliadin and glutenin in, in, um, in the prolamine grains, uh, and then also casein in, in dairy, that can stimulate the brain. Um, directly, so it can actually influence your behavior. Can be why we experience these foods as being very addictive, and why sometimes people even have a withdrawal when they stop eating them. So I focus on those, and I focus on um, the potential inflammatory uh, properties of those two foods. Um, but they also happen to mess with your blood sugar a lot, right? So they, they trigger this big insulin spike and it dips your blood sugar down and then you feel irritable and, you know, uh, headachey and jittery and lash out at people and then you crave carbs again. Um, so to sort of take you off that roller coaster, you really need to up your fat content so you're providing your body a more sustainable energy source that's going to balance out those peaks and valleys. Um, and it's also going to tug a lot less on cortisol. So you're going to end up yanking that stress hormone a lot less, which I believe is a major driver of a lot of the symptoms that women experience in, in perimenopause. Um, it's probably a major driver of a lot of 
the symptoms women experience, period. But yes. it's, uh, it's, it's one of the you know, ways we can modify hormonal balance, and it's, it's really through um, trying to stabilize blood sugar and diet. But it's just not always done in the way we think of, like you know, eliminating the Snickers and the ice cream, which is where you know, the, the grain um, part of it comes in and, and the dairy part of it. So, do you uh, have you read Grain Brain? Uh, I was just going to mention yeah. it. I'm reading that now, and I think you're talking a lot about it. And actually, my doctor, that my brand new doctor, said all these things too. Um, and it is, it's I've switched, and I don't have a lot of grain even. Um, it just didn't go well with me anymore. And it's a huge. The fog is kind of gone. Um, the the energy is higher. Um, things like that have changed. So yeah, it's, it's, I was going to mention it because you know uh, David Perlmutter has done incredible work bringing this to you know to light. Uh, this idea that sugar balance and specifically sugar balance potentially related to um, grain-based foods and flour-based foods is what's driving a lot of our brain-based problems. Um, and it's really you know it's there are many aspects of grains that can drive. Uh, you know, drive their problematic effects. Uh, one of them is is what makes whole grains actually just as uh, culpable, which is um, lect is called lectins. So this is sort of like natural defenses that these grains have uh, that you know are inflammatory in our systems when we eat them. And and the thinking is that we haven't over ten thousand years really evolved to manage. Um, you know, disarming these grains for our consumption. So it's it's pretty compelling. Uh, you know that there may be something to the fact that there's at least a portion of the population that's very sensitive to the inflammatory effects of, of you know of you know wheat and corn, um, and rice even particularly brown rice. So it's worth a try. It is worth a try. I, I, I've learned a lot and I've been going to my doctor a holistic doctor too since October I'd say and it's helped a whole bunch so when I got the chance to have you on it's like yay um, <laughs> together um, it is coming together and it does help uh, the hot flashes are still there and things like that so that's another question I have um, is it maca is that how you pronounce it yeah, yeah. yes do you yeah. pr do you recommend maca root um, I had never heard of it until uh, she told me about it. Do you recommend something like that? I do, I do. Um, you know, for the most part when I meet a patient we start with a month of the type of diet we're describing to, because then we can see what's left, right? So that's Good point. kind of where you're, where you're at. Uh, you know, now it sounds like. And then essentially you can think about the supplements that have been, or nutraceuticals that have been studied for um, perimenopause, and menopause are basically in two categories. So they're in a phytoestrogen category and a non-phytoestrogen category. So, so phytoestrogens would be the better known like soy, isoflavones, and flax. Um, and then the, the non would include things like uh, black cohosh and maca. Um, I use maca extensively in my practice. Um, there's one, you know, not to sort of like endorse company. I have no, no go relationship ahead. to, go but ahead. Uh, there's, there's one that I have found um, to be particularly effective. The, the company is Natural Health International, and they have a product called Feminescence. Um, it's a it's a gelatinized organic maca, so it's just it's very potent, and they've done a lot of analysis on the different amino acid profiles of the species. And anyway, they're pretty dedicated to it. They've also done some of their own research, which of course you have to you know take for what it is since since they did it. Um, but it's pretty compelling because they looked at how maca can normalize a lot of different hormonal parameters, so a bunch of different hormones like FSH and LH, but then also things like triglyceride. Uh, triglycerides and um, thyroid panels. So, what it does, it's called an adaptogen. There's only about like 12 identified in the world, um, which are these plants that help your body to adapt to a stressor, right? So, so we're taking the 
the sort of benefits of a plant and how it has struggled in its own environment and we are reaping those benefits when we consume it. So um, there's a couple of examples, things like ginseng and ashwagandha and rhodiola and maca is actually a tuber so it's like sort of you know a root um, and it's you know been traditionally used for, for uh, fertility and for sort of women's quote unquote issues uh, in, in South American cultures primarily and uh, I find it you know it's remarkable within about two months uh, it can you know revolutionize the the picture so you know like any you know like any natural supplement there, there's the source is important right so a maca is not a maca is not a maca like you can go to a smoothie stand and get some maca powder in your you know in your in your smoothie and you shouldn't expect that to have a therapeutic effect necessarily <laughs> but it uh, it can be it can be a great choice. I like it because it's sort of the most gentle uh, first line intervention. So if you know if using progesterone, let's say, or estrogen, testosterone, bioidentical hormones is at one end of the spectrum, this is really really at the other because it's just trying to coax your body into um, into harmony essentially. Ooh, I like that coaxing it into harmony. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Ridiculous. Uh, without actually providing hormones, so I think it's a I think it's a good choice. And then um, you know, and then using some of the you know using um, Siberian rhubarb or black cohosh. Some of, they actually have like a number of very decent randomized controlled trials demonstrating their safety and their efficacy. So, to my mind, and actually to the mind of most who. Um, have my training, you know, starting with a quote unquote food based option, progressing to an herbal, then progressing to a hormone um, if necessary is a pretty, pretty typical trajectory. That's sort of nicely of said. And talking about hormones, before I, this time is going by too fast. And I wanted to get this uh, one video that I saw on your website and we just showed it. Um, so, I, I thought it was very interesting and you have another article I couldn't find it right before the show but it's about drop that pill why I want my patients off birth control and I it's only what three minutes long can you tell us a little bit about uh, this video that everybody should be getting on Kelly Brogan uh, md.com and checking her whole website out it's all about birthing and paleo diet and uh, all sorts of interesting stuff that she um, has on here but can you tell us about this drop that pill yes yeah, so I you know I'm I'm a feminist and I believe in a woman's right to determine when is the best time in her life to have a child um, I took birth control for 12 years and when I started to uh, research the role of inflammation in health, I was pretty shocked to find a body of evidence supporting um, the you know, the synthetic uh, hormones in a typical birth control uh, being implicated. And then I dug a little further and I found data that suggested that actually these hormones in an oral contraceptive actually deplete antioxidants, they deplete B vitamins, they deplete um, important nutrient cofactors that we need to manage our inflammation but also to, to help our bodies function optimally. Um, and, you know, it really makes sense because there's nothing natural about it, obviously, about a synthetic hormone. Our body does not utilize it in the same way. It needs to be metabolized extensively in the liver. Um, and there, you know, there's a, a strong um, suggestion, if not a confirmatory data uh, base, to suggest that these synthetic hormones cause a lot of psychiatric symptoms in people who might not otherwise ever develop depression, let's say. Um, so, you know, when it comes to hormones, bioidentical versus synthetic is really, a, you know, a world apart. But um, I generally, when it, you know, when it comes to contraception, think that we need to leave our hormones alone. <laughs> leave them where, where they are. And if they're not functioning optimally, then we need to work on that, you know, I rather agree. than express it. So it's, uh, you know, so there are other options um, in terms of contraception, but in terms of regulating your period, we need to go through the steps we just talked about that are actually really the same, whether it's perimenopause or, or PMS or polycystic ovary. The steps are pretty similar um, in terms of starting with lifestyle. So starting with, you know, starting with 
um, regaining, you know, some health stability before we throw, you know, that throw prescription pill. That Here, yeah. take a pill, take a pill, take a pill. <laughs> I've heard it all. Exactly. Uh, you are wonderful. And so, uh, first off, where is your office um, in case people are around by you? Um, tell us where your office is. Yes. So, um, as we were chatting before the show, I'm in I'm in uh, Midtown Manhattan, and uh, I, it's you know there's a high demand for this type of service in Manhattan. I think because it's a very stressful and somewhat toxic place to live. So I've tried to create a, a bit of a, an oasis in my in my office. I'm very interested in you know sort of clean environment and and looking at the you know. The way the tools we have to set up sort of like the healthiest little pod oh. we can our little spaces but i can show you uh right here um on here is it on this one yeah here is her office <laughs> uh she has it on her website too and it's got the address and her phone number everything you need to make an appointment if you're close because i recommend going to dr kelly for sure um and also her website, I'll just tell you while we've got it right here. It's Kelly Brogan, MD again, Kelly Brogan, MD.com. And then you have Facebook and Twitter, correct? Yes, I'm a pretty active blogger. Uh, I love to write and sort of distill, you know, I have a newsletter trying to distill oh. new evidence and make it useful to people because um, there's a lot, you know, there's so much fascinating research out there and it takes so long to get to the surface, uh, you know, unless there are, you know, folks interested in, in bringing it to light. So you can't wait for your doctor who's not reading the literature to bring it to you. I know uh, that one. Got to source your own source your own info so I, I try to do that for people don't we all and here at the bottom of her website on her home page might be on every page I haven't looked but it says newsletter sign up I know I'll be signing up uh, for her newsletter um, Kelly Brogan Dr. Kelly Brogan I love you and I hope I can have you back and we could talk about um, the birthing part that you do so well it looks like on your website so I'd love to talk to you about that sometime Anytime. It'd be a total pleasure. It's one of my favorite topics. Oh, good. Uh, so thank you again. Everybody get on her website and start reading about it. Thank you all for joining us tonight. And Kelly, thanks again. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Okay, so that was Kelly. I, oh, I just love that um, subject. I'm very passionate about it. Uh, next week, I have for the, I don't know, he's my number one uh, guest now in the top 10 of uh, how many p times I've had this guy on, but Taylor Gluten Away will be on again uh, next week, but with his girlfriend, Brianne, and they met um, when they discovered they both had uh, this disordered called POTS. And so I want him to explain what the heck POTS is. I've never heard of it. So he'll be on with his girlfriend uh, next Monday night. So until then, have a great G-Free and happy week.